Hello. Um, um, thank you for coming to the KGRI, KGRI lecture series. Uh, today's speaker is Mr. Daniel Ball. Uh, he's a fellow at the Rational Center for East Asian Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. So the title of his lecture is The U.S. Midterm Elections of 2018, Implications for American Policy Toward Asia. This is a um, very exciting topic. I'm very uh, honored to have here uh, today. And he's a, a guest uh, professor now at the Keio University. He will stay here uh, 10 more days uh, at the Keio University. So he will have uh, some classes and lectures uh, in Midi campus and Shona, which is our campus. So he's helping our education at Keio University now. So he has a very long, long um, 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 background bio, actually. But uh, some um, uh, I want to mention uh, some only. He was working for the um, Finance Committee of the U.S. Senate and a Foreign Affairs uh, uh, Committee of the uh, U.S. Congress House. And so he also worked at the executive branch. Uh, and so he is uh, working in the uh, private sector, too. And he, uh, very recently, so before uh, moving to the, uh, the size of uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University, he worked at think tanks, uh, including Sasako Peace Foundation and so CFL, Council for on Foreign Relations. So he has a very long experience at, in Washington, D.C., uh, working for uh, U.S. and Asia uh, relations. Um, so he has a, a policy uh, uh, practitioner. So he has a very good connection in Washington, D.C. politics. And he knows what's going on in, under Trump administration. So it must be a very exciting uh, talk. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And so the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Daniel Bob. Thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much, Motohira san I really appreciate the uh, invitation to come here, and it's a real pleasure to spend time at Keio University uh, as a visiting professor. I was actually uh, a visiting uh, uh, scholar here in 2003, uh, quite some time ago. I had been, uh, when I was with the Council on Foreign Relations, I spent about uh, a year and a half here in Japan and, and spent a little bit of time at Keio, so it's, it's great to be back. Well, um, as Motohira-san mentioned, I'm going to talk about the uh, U.S. midterm elections and where U.S. policy toward Northeast Asia may be headed in their aftermath. Um, so let me first talk a little bit about the results of the, the midterm elections. Uh, there is still one race in the House of Representatives that has not been decided, and there's another uh, that is currently being renewed. But at a minimum, the Democrats have won uh, 39 s seats more in the uh, House of Representatives than they had before the election. And as a result, they will be in the, major in the majority, <coughs> excuse me, when the new Congress convenes next month. And so, that means that they'll be in control of all the committees uh, which conduct the hearings and investigations, and they'll be able to set the House agenda. Um, the number of seats that's changed hands in this election from Republican to Democrat was actually the largest since the 1974 uh, elections. Uh, and voter interest was particularly high this year. Um, the percentage of voters uh, who cast their ballots, eligible voters, was actually the largest in a midterm election in more than 100 years. Um, and when you look at the, when you total all the House races together and the votes that were cast, Democrats received 53% of all those votes cast in the House elections compared to Republicans who received 45%. So it's an eight percentage point margin, and that's, that's one of the largest margins in that particular category in recent history. Now in the Senate, uh, the Republicans actually gained two seats, and that 
course, means that they will retain their majority in the Senate, and they'll hold the reins of power in that body. But it's important to keep in mind that in the Senate, uh, uh, senators uh, serve six-year terms, uh, unlike the House, where they serve only two-year terms. So unlike the House, where, where members are up every two years for re-election, only about a third or so of senators are up for re-election in any given two-year election. Um, and in this particular election, there were 35 Senate races, and uh, of those, Democrats were the incumbents. They were the ones holding the seat in 26 of the 35 elections. And of those 20, 26 seats, 10 of them were in states, senators represent a whole state, 10 of them were in states that uh, Mr. Trump had won in 2016. So given that, Republicans actually had a, a very significant advantage uh, in the Senate elections. And so the, the, the fact that they gained two seats was, was not really quite the victory that uh, uh, the president had claimed. Uh, there were a variety of other uh, state and local races, um, and uh, though that's not terribly significant for U.S. relations in, with, with uh, Asia, Democrats did fairly well. Among other things, they, they had a net gain of seven governors uh, and five state legislative chambers. So on balance, um, Demo Democrats did quite well. <clears throat> but since the Republicans retained uh, hold over the Senate, it was not quite what Democrats had hoped for, the so-called blue wave, a massive uh, 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 victory for Democrats, which they had hoped would have not only resulted in taking over the House, but also the Senate, um, and would therefore have been interpreted by most Americans as a pretty much a wholesale rejection of President Trump by the American public. It didn't, didn't reach that level. Now, what's important for U.S. policy toward Asia uh, and more generally for U.S. domestic and, and foreign policy is that Mr. Trump will no longer have a fully compliant Congress to deal with, which is the case for the past two years. Uh, instead, he's going to face an opposition party with control of the House and importantly, investigative powers and the ability to block any legislative initiatives he might want to sponsor. So we'll have divided government. Now, divided government is not at all unusual in the United States, uh, particularly in recent decades. But what's different now is America is far more polarized than it has been at any point in modern history. And in fact, this election is going to make that polarization worse. The reason for that is that the Republicans who were defeated tended to come from more moderate districts uh, than, the, than the districts that are spread around the country uh, as a whole. And they lost in those districts, I'm talking about the House here, uh, uh, with these more moderate constituencies because those were uh, areas where support for Trump and for the Republican Party has declined since 2016. They were tighter districts, so Democrats had a better chance, and that's where they, they picked up many of their seats. Uh, so we've lost a lot of the, uh, the Republicans who tended to be at least a little more skeptical about uh, President Trump. In addition, there were quite a number of Republicans who retired. Uh, and of those who retired, most of the very few Republicans who were actually willing to uh, criticize Trump 
from the Republican Party are gone. Virtually all of them have left the House and the Senate. Um, and the Republican members of Congress who are left uh, really uh, are fear uh, to challenge Trump. And that's for a very specific reason. His popularity with the base of the Republican Party, the Republican voters, his approval ratings among those Republicans have consistently been in the 85 to 90 percent range uh, since he took office, with about 60 percent of Republicans strongly approving of him. That's historically, since the uh, start of polling in the 50s, that's historically high on a consistent basis. There, there are Republican uh, presidents whose approval rating spikes and goes up and down. His, among Republican uh, voters, what I'm talking about, has been consistently high. Uh, and on the reverse side of that, um, among registered Democrats, disapproval of Trump has been at historically high uh, levels. In fact, disapproval is even among Democrats of Trump is even more intense than it is uh, among the Republicans who approve of him. More than 90% of registered Democrats uh, actually disapprove of Trump. And about 80% of Democrats strongly disapprove of him. So when you look at this, the disparity, the difference between Republican approval and Democratic disapproval is the largest uh, partisan divide over a president in American, well, in, in the history of polling. Um, so that, that polarization is truly significant. Um, now, um, the, the party, the Republican Party really now fully is uh, the party of Trump in the aftermath of this election. Because again, there are very few Republicans who are willing to criticize him or challenge him on most any issue. Um, and though many uh, of the Democrats tried to run elections based not so much just against Trump, they, they, for the most part, uh, they made Trump, or at least tried to make Trump, a secondary issue in their elections and emphasized other issues. Most importantly, they emphasized health care, the idea of health care for all Americans. But, of course, there was a strong undercurrent in all these uh, Democratic candidates' uh, elections uh, about the hope to gain one control of one or both the Senate and the House so that they could, Democrats, uh, uh, gain a majority and serve to check the, the excesses of, of the Trump administration. Now again, political polarization and partisanship in the United States is not new, and it really has been growing uh, for the past quarter century. Uh, I arrived in Washington in 1991 at a time when the idea of bipartisanship was actually a positive thing. I worked for a moderate Republican senator uh, who uh, really could not fit into the modern uh, Republican Party anymore. He would not have won his election. Um, so it's been a, a consistent long-term trend toward greater polarization. But Trump and his presidency has, has intensified that polarization dramatically. Uh, among other things, unlike his predecessors, he makes virtually no attempt to bridge the partisan divide. In fact, um, quite the opposite. He rallies his base by demonizing Democrats and demonizing his opposition. Um, now, the day after the election, the midterm election, President Trump did hold a news conference uh, in which he actually offered something of an olive branch to Democrats, but there was a huge caveat that came with that. Um, 
he said he'd be willing to work with Democrats uh, on a few legislative priorities that he said he shared with, with Democrats. The, there were three that he listed. The first was infrastructure spending. Um, the second was on trade issues, where he tends to have a, a, a view of trade that's more in line with sort of labor Democrats. And the third was on health care, the idea that those who have so-called pre-existing conditions should not have to pay more for their health care. But the caveat he mentioned was significant. He said, if Democrats actually launched investigations into him, he would absolutely not work with Democrats. And in fact, he said he would adopt, he in quotes, a warlike posture, a warlike posture against the Democrats. Um, now, constitutionally, the role of Congress is to provide checks and balances on the executive branch. And of course, that includes oversight hearings, but also investigative hearings. Um, under Republican control of the House and Senate for the past two years, uh, Congress really failed to fulfill that, that uh, role. And that's, again, because of the, the great popularity of Trump. Um, but Democrats who voted uh, for their elected officials, particularly those who voted for House members so that they could gain a majority and, and take over the committees and hold these sorts of hearings and investigations, f expect and would demand uh, that those hearings be held. And they will be held. In fact, um, Democrats have already indicated a whole variety of hearings uh, and investigations that they plan to engage in. Uh, a few of the things that they've already mentioned, uh, and there'll be many more, but a few that will be high priorities will be an examination into whether the Trump campaign uh, coordinated with Russia to influence the 2016 election, a look into whether the president actually obstructed the Mueller investigation, uh, an assessment of the role that Trump played in paying off two women uh, who say they had affairs with him uh, and he uh, paid them off to silence them in the closing weeks of the election campaign in 2016. There will be an attempt to force him to make his tax returns public. They're going to look into his daughter Ivanka Trump's email Use. She was uh, actually using her personal email to conduct government business. And though they, they will uh, hold off on uh, until after the Mueller investigation findings are in, uh, there's a pretty, depending on what they are, uh, I think uh, they, they will quite possibly uh, go ahead with impeachment proceedings in the House against the President. Meanwhile, the Mueller investigation is uh, into the Russian election interference um, and the Trump, and Trump team's possible complicity in that, um, which had, had basically uh, gone quiet for the two months before the election, which is the custom in the United States. It's clearly, as you've seen uh, in the newspapers, it's now back in full swing. Um, we just last week had Trump's former personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, plead guilty to lying to Congress. That came out. His former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, who had a plea agreement with Mueller's uh, uh, team, that fell apart because he had been lying to them. Um, and uh, we had some documents that were filed just uh, yesterday on uh, Michael Flynn, his uh, national security advisor for 26 days before he was forced out um, and indicted. Um, so that's all happening right now, um, and it's, it's picking up speed. And uh, it 
It's hard to say, but there are some indications, there have been some reports uh, that the Mueller team is closing in on finishing up their work um, and may do so within the next couple of months. We'll see. Um, regardless, it will be coming to a, a conclusion before too long. And I would say there's, there's some expectation uh, uh, fairly wide held that uh, among many other things that we'll see will possibly be an indictment of one of President Trump's sons, uh, Trump Jr. Um, and there is a possibility as well that Trump may even be uh, an un a so-called unindicted co-conspirator in one or more crimes, the same as uh, uh, Nixon was also which led to his, his uh, the impeachment proceedings and ultimately him resigning. We'll see. It's, it's, uh, the Mueller investigation has been extremely good at preventing leaks. Um, now adding to this ne very negative landscape between the investigations the House will be conducting, the Mueller investigations and so forth, is the fact that uh, the 2020 presidential election has already started. It started the day after the, the elections here. We have a never-ending cycle of elections in the United States. And there are dozens, at least 30 viable Democratic, potential viable Democratic candidates, upwards of maybe 40, who, uh, who are out there testing the waters. And inevitably, quite a number of them will launch their campaigns and that sheer number, which is pretty much unprecedented, uh, is going to mean, uh, because, of, because the Democratic base is so anti-Trump, there's surely going to be a competition among these Democratic candidates um, to take a very hard line on Mr. Trump. So as he finishes out his last two years of his, his first term and seeks re-election, re Trump is really going to be under serious attack from all sides. Now, as he always does, when he's attacked, he'll attack back. Um, but in order to win in 2020, he's going to have to do more than simply fend off attacks. He's going to have to demonstrate his effectiveness as a leader to win a majority uh, of the electoral college, if not of the overall vote. Um, so he's going to have to seek some substantial accomplishments in his last year, two years, or, or at least uh, accomplishments that, that he uh, 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 can claim are substantial uh, accomplishments. Because, of course, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's a huge gulf uh, between what he claims and what he actually does. Whatever Trump does is always the greatest, it's the biggest, it's the best in American history, regardless of, of the facts. I mean, there are a few small things he can do. Uh, he can continue to appoint conservative judges uh, because confirmation of judges does not require a vote in the House. It only of, requires a vote of approval in, in the Senate. But simply appointing conservative judges is really not going to win him an election. It's, it caters to a very small part of his base. Um, more than anything, I think what he'd like to see uh, is the U.S. economy continue to grow for the next two years. But the Federal Reserve is an independent institution. Um, it's been raising rates and been rather uh, 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 reluctant to uh, ease monetary policy. The effects of the Trump tax cut are wearing off, it won't, won't be in effect next year. And the U.S. economy and the world economy are showing signs of slowing down. In fact, the, the bond markets in the U.S., uh, uh, the uh, so-called yield curve, which is a very good indicator of where the economy is headed, is flattening. Uh, and if it inverts, not to get 
to a technical, but the, the, the inversion of the bond yield, which we're closing in on possibly, is, is a, uh, typically a very good indicator that we're headed for a recession. But any major initiative on Trump's part to spur the economy through fiscal policy, further tax cuts and so forth, will require legislation. Um, and that means cooperation with Democrats, at least in the House. And again, that cooperation, when you're on a war footing against the House, uh, seems highly unlikely. And, and th the same is, is true for any major domestic initiative. That has to be done through legislation. That has to pass both houses of Congress. And, and the two parties are so far apart on most all domestic issues. Um, uh, the prospect of any domestic successes for Trump, I think, is very small. That takes us to foreign policy uh, and trade and security matters. And presidents have a much freer hand uh, to uh, conduct those matters without congressional interference. And so it's easier to score victories um, in the foreign realm. Or, unfortunately, more darkly, to engage in military adventurism. But let me first talk, uh, mainly talk about potential uh, international achievements. Um, on that score, Trump's main focus uh, currently is on Asia, specifically Northeast Asia. Um, he did complete his, already his modest, very modest revision of the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement. But now he's pursuing a major trade deal with China. He's launching a, a forced a, a bilateral trade negotiation with Japan. Uh, he's uh, trying to conclude a deal with North Korea on nuclear issues. And then China generally, he is trying to do a major reset in the overall US-China relationship. Um, he really wants a, a, a summit meeting with Kim Jong-un in the very near future. He's talked about January or perhaps February um, to advance that denuclearization. Um, and uh, the China trade negotiation is on a rather short time frame since he's threatened to raise tariffs on a, uh, a quarter billion dollars worth of Chinese exports to the US up to 25%, um, and uh, but based on his dinner meeting with the president of China, Xi Jinping, over this past uh, weekend, he pushed that off for a three-month period, three-month timeline, though the Chinese have still not yet confirmed that there, in fact, was a three-month timeline. The trade negotiations with Japan are on a somewhat slower uh, uh, time frame uh, than North Korea and China. Um, the overall reset of relations with China will be uh, basically a, a massive and long-term ongoing effort. Um, now, in pursuing these uh, areas uh, in Northeast Asia, it's um, tempting to hope that they will be done in the context of his announced strategy for a free and open Indo-Pacific, as he's called it, which is a term he actually borrowed from Prime Minister Abe. But if you look at that um, strategy, it's extraordinarily vague. Um, the, the actual policies that this administration has adopted across the region and the rhetoric of the, of the president actually belie what that strategy purports to achieve. And, and that is, in brief, uh, among other things, to increase American investment in the region, strengthen the rule of law, ensure freedom of navigation, uh, deepen alliances, and so forth. Um, but that strategy is really just aspirational. It's, it's, a, it's a set of goals um, 
And there are, thus far anyway, no coherent policies or an implementation plan, and there are no resources set aside uh, with which to follow through. Um, and I think ultimately that vagueness uh, in, in this free and open Indo-Pacific really reflects the president himself. Quite simply, he's not a strategic thinker. Um, and he showed a willingness repeatedly to, to shred international agreements, to attack international institutions um, that the United States built uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. He picks fights with our, the, the heads of state of our closest uh, allies. He devalues uh, human rights as a US foreign policy objective. Um, he seeks stronger ties with dictators like Vladimir Putin. Putin. Um, so I think that's all a reflection of who this president is. And despite the announcement of this, uh, this grand Indo, a free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, it, it's hard to see that happening um, in any substantive way. And, you know, one of the f very first acts, it was day three after President Trump took office, he withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, that was a trade agreement, uh, but it only would have had very modest impact, economic impact on the United States. What it was more so, more important than an economic and trade agreement was that it would have very substantially advanced American strategic aims in countering a rising and more aggressive China. So if anything, uh, uh, a f uh, an Indo-Pacific strategy really should have started with the United States rejoining the TPP, or CPT, CPTPP as it's currently called. Um, and in the case of, of Japan and Korea, it's important to remember that Trump has repeatedly questioned our alliances with both countries. Um, uh, and, and both are crucial to US interests and any effective American strategy in the region. Now Trump, if you look at his history, there are very, very few areas or, or issues where he's had um, strong convictions or long-standing beliefs. He goes all over the place, with a very few exceptions. Um, one area where he, he's had consistent views for more than 30 years is his very skeptical uh, view of our alliances with Japan in particular, but Korea as well. He has always maintained, you can look back 30 years over his statements, He's always maintained that the two countries simply do not spend enough on American troops and bases uh, in the two countries, despite very generous host nation support from, from both countries. In fact, basing troops in Japan is cheaper than basing troops in the United States. But he's criticized both countries for that, criticized both countries for not spending enough on their own security. Um, he's also long maintained uh, very, what I would say, are unconventional views on, on trade. He views trade as a zero-sum game, uh, and he keeps score on trade very simply based on the size of our bilateral deficits or surpluses with, with uh, countries. And of course, <clears throat> the United States runs its largest trade deficit in goods and services with China. Uh, and Japan, we've been running large uh, deficits uh, for the past 30 years, though last year um, deficit in, in, in goods and services in Japan was actually fourth, uh, closely after Mexico and Germany. But I think Trump sort of has not changed his opinion on this for 30 years, and he's, he views Japan as uh, our trade deficit with Japan as a particular problem. Um, at any rate, given the political, negative political situation in the United States after the midterms for the president, the lack of any overarching strategic concept for the Indo-Pacific, uh, 
Um, and Trump's need for achievements uh, before the 2020 elections, his particular obsessions with trade and alliances, um, that I think is a background to talk about where the U.S. may be headed on Northeast Asia. <clears throat> so first, I want to touch upon North Korea. Now, <clears throat> I think Trump views a deal, a potential deal with North Korea, as his single biggest potential win. And that's why he's been so publicly pursuing a second summit with, with um, Kim Jong-un. The problem is that um, unless North Korea is truly willing to give up its nuclear weapons program and allow extremely intrusive inspections to uh, confirm that they have been, his weapons have been removed irreversibly, there's any sort of deal with North Korea is not all that terribly useful for the United States. Uh, now, even after the first meeting between Trump and Kim in Singapore, um, the only result of that was an extremely vague communique where North Korea committed to work towards complete denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula in exchange for American security guarantees and a call for new relations and uh, lasting and stable peace, all of which sounds great. And Trump, even while he was still on the ground in, in Singapore, uh, sent out a tweet uh, which said, and I'm quoting here, this is when he's still in, in Singapore, Everyone, everybody can now feel much safer than the day I took office. There is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea, which is on its face preposterous. Um, it's not true. Um, and in the aftermath of that uh, uh, first summit, um, American negotiators have been um, seeking some tangible pro uh, progress um, on de denuclearization because the nuclear threat is, is still there. And the negotiators, the American negotiators, leaving aside Trump, um, have maintained that North Korea must take the next steps, real steps, to give up its nuclear program before uh, receiving anything from the United States. In particular, they've been looking for uh, a list of what the nuclear assets are from North Korea. North Korea takes the opposite uh, approach. They, they claim that they've already frozen their nuclear testing. They dismantled a nuclear test site, which was um, not terribly useful anyway. And so they say the United States must, must act first. Um, and uh, then what the Koreans want is an easing of economic sanctions um, they've also been trying to get a, a declaration uh, to end the state of war that still exists between the two countries uh, because there was no peace treaty that actually ended the Korean War. We're still technically at a, at a state of war with, with the Koreans. Um, I followed these, the North Korea issues since 1991, uh, took a visit to North Korea in 1991 when I was in the Senate. and. Uh, I just, I, I find it very difficult to believe that, that North Korea, under any circumstances, is actually going to be willing to truly give up its nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons fundamentally are the guarantor for North Korea's survival under this current regime. Um, and Trump's, some of his closest advisors actually take a very hard line on North Korea. That includes the Secretary of State. It includes his national security advisor, John Bolton, who has over the years, at least before he went into uh, the White House, has consistently called for a preemptive military strike against nuclear, North Korea's nuclear facilities. And knowing Bolton a little bit, I am sure he still believes that that is the way forward. Um, but but uh, he's not the president. Um, and just the day before yesterday, he was asked in a public uh, meeting about uh, Trump's desire for another summit. And here's what he said. Um, the North Koreans, they have not lived up to their commitment so far. 
That's why I think the President thinks another summit is likely to be productive. I'm not sure how that makes sense if it didn't work the first time, that it becomes more productive the second time, but that's the explanation that he gave. Now, I have no doubt that even if there was another summit, there will be another communique, even if it was extremely modest, even if it was another vague deal, um, one that does not lead to any real verifiable uh, North Korean denuclearization. The president, of course, would talk about it, again, as the greatest achievement in, in for peace in Northeast Asian history, a, a deal that no other president could ever have achieved, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Bolton also yesterday said if there was a deal, he would deserve a Nobel Peace Prize and so on. Um, so I think that's what he's aiming for. And I, I think a very modest deal uh, is, uh, or communique, is certainly achievable. Um, and I could imagine something along the following lines. There would, be, there would be some form of security guarantees that would be made, perhaps uh, in the form of some sort of non-aggression pact. I'm sure there would be aspirational language, once again, about North Korea denuclearizing, or, or there would be uh, across the peninsula denuclearization. Um, there might even be the U.S. be willing to offer some small easing of sanctions uh, on North Korea. Um, and what the North Koreans apparently are looking for at the moment are some very limited exceptions on um, certain of those sanctions. So that would essentially be pretty meaningless. Um, it would offer Democrats a chance to hold some hearings on it, point to the flaws and failures of such an agreement. Um, but Trump, of course, would still declare victory. A couple things to keep in mind, by the way, on, on U.S. Uh, uh, talks with North Korea. Um, despite the very real threat that North Korea poses to Japan, uh, the substantial threat, and despite uh, Trump's uh, assurances to Prime Minister Abe that he would keep in mind uh, the security threats to Japan, there is no indication that uh, Japan is figuring into Trump's calculations on a deal with North Korea at the moment. Meanwhile, um, it's important to understand as well that um, uh, President Moon Jae-in of, of South Korea, his ambitions for progress on a North on North-South relations um, really seem to align very much with uh, Trump's own desire for some sort of deal. In particular, Moon is interested at the moment in uh, spurring uh, greater South Korean investment and trade across the demilitarized zone. Um, uh, and if sanctions were eased in any respect, um, that, would, that would make uh, that more attractive. So let me turn to China. <clears throat> um, currently, uh, it's clear that the, the Trump administration considers China a global rival, um, and it, in, in the context of, of what it has termed, in, uh, quoting here, an age of great power competition. Uh, Vice President Pence outlined uh, the administration's views on China in a speech he delivered uh, just a few weeks ago in October. Uh, and he attacked China for its, its hacking and espionage attempts within the United States, its theft of U.S. technological secrets, unfair trade practices, its very aggressive uh, diplomacy, uh, and its brutal crackdown on the rights of some of its ethnic and religious minorities. Um, and as he said, uh, China wants nothing less than to push the United States of America from the Western Pacific and attempt to prevent us uh, from coming to the aid of our allies. Um, his response, Trump, Pence said, the U.S. response should be to confront Beijing's worldwide economic and strategic aggression, oppose its internal repression, and attempt to compel China uh, and its government to change its behavior. 
Now that's a very tall order, uh, and it's also a major departure from, U from U.S. policy, um, and one that China clearly is going to resist. Um, now, Trump's rhetoric, I think, does align with Japan's own concerns about China, um, and it's actually um, finding some support across the, bi across the partisan divide in the United States. Um, but it puts many of the countries in this region in a position which they have long sought to avoid. And that's a choice between having to choose between the United States and China. Um, and the only real alternative for them, uh, which seems to be the preferred choice at this, at this point, is to wait out the Trump administration and hope that there's a change in 2020. Um, in terms of gaining real security uh, for the United States and the region, the, the real key to, to dealing with China's aggressive behavior uh, in the East, South China Sea, and el elsewhere is to reinforce our alliances uh, with Japan, with Korea, Australia, and reinforce our strategic partnerships with un other countries across the region. But again, Trump views um, these alliances with, with great skepticism. He treats our partners shabbily. Um, and as a consequence, he undermines our ability to confront China in the way that Vice President uh, Pence has suggested in his speech. Um, and in fact, uh, Trump's policies and behavior have offered an unprecedented opportunity for China to fill what really is a growing vacuum left by the United States as it is abandoning the global system that it created 70 years ago. Um, yesterday, uh, the state, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Secretary of State Pompeo gave a major speech in, in uh, Brussels uh, about um, where the U.S. is in the world. And it's, it's I, I recommend looking at it. It's, it's quite short. Um, you can watch a video of it on YouTube. But in that speech, he attacked multilateralism generally. But very specifically, he attacked the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, the European Union. He even attacked the Organization of American States, the African Union the World Trade Organization, the International Criminal Court, um, and maybe a couple others I didn't quite pick up. In fact, he had praise for only three international entities. The first was SWIFT. That's the, the, this international banking agreement that allows cross-border uh, payments. The second was something called the Proliferation Security Initiative, a modest effort that the US developed under the George W. Bush administration directed in North Korea, and NATO. And of course, NATO is, is an organization that Trump has, himself has repeatedly attacked. Um, so, and, and in this speech, there's virtually, there are virtually no ideas that, that um, Pompeo offers as an alternative to the existing world order other than placing greater emphasis on sovereignty. Um, now, more on China. In the near term, trade is, is obviously the area where the United States and China are engaged in a very serious confrontation. And uh, it may very well uh, blow up into a full-blown trade war within the next um, 90 days, if, if in fact that's the, the, the period that the Chinese agreed to, which again, they haven't said they, they would. Um, um, and there's no doubt that China engages in highly predatory trade practices, um, and I think the size of its surplus, trade surplus with the United States is over the long term anyway politically unsustainable. Um, but even as he's ratcheted up his rhetoric um, and imposed uh, uh, tariffs and threatened greater tariffs, he has not uh, brought a single effective case against China to the World Trade Organization. And there's been no serious attempt on his part to enlist the support of our friends and allies who are facing some of the same concerns about uh, trade practices. As usual, he's negotiating this on a strictly bilateral basis, which 
doesn't provide the greatest leverage. Um, moreover, the, the, the demands of China that he's making on trade are, are vast, they're sweeping, and ultimately get to some structural issues in China that they simply will be uh, opposed. It, it gets to the very Chinese system, and those can't be addressed in, in 90 days. Um, moreover, if there was a trade war with China, the impact on the U.S. economy would be extremely negative. And again, this is a time when Trump needs the economy to thrive if he's going to be reelected. Um, and we've seen what's happened in the markets over the past couple days. Uh, uh, his his he basically again declared victory in his in his dinner with with Xi, but that what he's claimed has not proved to be true, and the the markets have reacted extremely negatively. And then if you look at at the trade deals that that the United States constructed with South Korea, and more recently with Canada and Mexico, if they're any guide. Um, those were very incremental uh, trade deals. There was nothing of uh, a, any great fundamental value that came out of that. So if there are any guide, um, I, I suspect um, what will end up with China is another very incremental um, sort of deal, one that, that doesn't address these fundamental issues on trade. But again, they would allow him to declare victory and, and move on. Finally, on Japan. Uh, now, leaving aside the withdrawal from TPP, which again, at its well, at, at its economic core, and, and it, the economics were not as crucial as, as the broader strategic value. But at its economic core, TPP, as it was originally constructed, was essentially a U.S.-Japan free trade agreement. Um, but aside from withdrawing from TPP, uh, Trump's actions on Japan have not, his actions, not his rhetoric, but his actions have not strayed all that far from previous uh, uh, administrations. Um, and actually, if, if you, the, the trade negotiation that was forced on Japan under the threat of 25% tariffs on autos and auto, ex, auto parts exports to the United States, in many respects, that is really an attempt on the part of Trump to recapture the benefits of TPP that we lost, the United States lost, by abandoning TPP. Um, now, autos and auto exports to the United States for, account for most of Japan's trade surplus with the US, but um, auto manufacturers have done virtually nothing to push sales in, in Japan. In fact, Ford pulled out of this market. Um, so. Uh, what that means is to the extent that autos and auto parts are addressed in this, in this deal, and they will be, I'm quite certain, because of Trump's interest, uh, it's likely that they're going to seek provisions uh, to, to, uh, in, uh, to, to place uh, voluntary export restraints on, on Japanese car exports to the United States. Um, and VRAs, as they're called, were actually last used on autos against Japan in the very early 80s. But it's something that uh, US Trade Representative Brad Lighthizer is, is quite familiar with. He was because he served as deputy USTR back in the Reagan administration at that, at, at that point. What, what those do, if in fact those are imposed, is uh, provide an impetus, a push for Japanese companies to shift even more of their production to the United States, and that may be politically sensitive, I would think, for Japan. More important for actual American exports to Japan is agriculture, um, and that's because American farmers are at a, will be at a disadvantage in, in exporting agriculture uh, to Japan as compared to Canada, to Australia, New Zealand, and the other signatories of the CPTPP. They are all, and, and that comes into effect later this month. Um, they'll also be at a disadvantage compared to European exporters uh, once the EU-Japan FTA comes into effect. Um, but importantly for Japan, uh, uh, in these new talks, both sides have agreed that Japan's agriculture market commitments to the United States are not going to exceed uh, Tokyo's other 
Um, there has been a call for early achievements uh, by in, in in the statement on on the bilateral trade talks, uh, some sort of early harvest um, on barriers to trade uh, trade and goods. But leaving that that early harvest aside, so far it seems Japan's strategy on these talks is to try and drag them out as long as possible, and ideally wait until the end of the Trump administration, which uh, in 2020 if that. So it's much like the countries in the region and how they're responding to Trump's uh, China challenge. So overall, um, I think uh, the Trump policies toward Northeast Asia are really just a pretty incoherent assemblage. Um, they don't amount to much of an overarching strategy. They don't really, as far as I can tell, fit into this vague, free and open Indo-Pacific. I mean, after all, um, we talk to North Korea, but we, we, we want to talk to North Korea, but we're ignoring Japan's interests. Um, Trump questions our alliances with Japan and South Korea, even as he challenges China. He forces Japan into trade negotiations uh, as, a, as a poor substitute for rejoining TPP. Um, and when it comes to truly significant deals, uh, particularly with North Korea and China, I really think what will end up are just, just very incremental ones which allow him to simply declare victory. Again, Democrats will try and hold him to account, but the very fact that soon they will be in charge of the House and limit Trump's ability to act domestically is, in a way, prodding Trump toward this greater focus on, on foreign policy and trade policy where he has a much freer hand. Let me just end with a, <clears throat> a cautionary note. Um, again, while Trump is going to welcome the chance to claim any victory he can on trade or foreign policy, regardless of the substance, um, those victories could very well prove trans transitory, or they could simply be revealed as uh, uh, just simply not transformational. Um, or in the case of a deal with China, the market reaction is going to have a pretty big uh, implication. It's, it's a reality check on these things. Um, and, and then we've got the Mueller investigation, the House investigation. So Trump may have to look for other things uh, to change the subject. And unfortunately, changing the subject, diverting attention, uh, whatever you may think of Trump, he is a master at that. He's better than anyone I've seen in, a, in American politics. And unfortunately, the best way to change the subject, to divert attention, is to engage in some sort of military action. Um, Americans always rally behind the troops when there's a military action, and generally they rally to the president. Now, I'd like to think Trump is not going to go down that path, but I think he's absolutely capable of doing so, especially if he faces what he views as an existential threat to him and his presidency, to members of his family, and to his personal fortune. Um, and there are plenty of hawks in his administration who, again, Bolton, he would love a preemptive military strike against North Korea. He's called for preemptive military strikes against Iran. So Trump would have the pretext and the, and the benefit of, of uh, members of, of his own uh, administration who support him. And he's got the benefit of Fox News and right-wing media that reflexively report, uh, support whatever actions he, he chooses to take. So um, the next two years uh, are going to be pretty interesting, perhaps a little too interesting, uh, but a lot of it's going to revolve around what happens in this part of the world in Northeast Asia. So thank you very much. Uh, I've gone on too long here, but I think we have some, some time for, for questions if, if uh, any of you have them. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a great observation on what's going on in Washington, in Asia, in the United States at this stage. So we don't know 
what really happens in the future, but we have got uh, some clues to how to navigate in troubled waters. So uh, I want to take questions if you have, and um, well, maybe so it takes time for Japanese to raise a hand, so I want to start, if you don't mind. So um, you talked about North Korea and China, but some people said he, President Trump was just trying to blind people's eyes uh, before the uh, midterm election. So um, he wanted to hide other scandals, so maybe women or uh, Russian connections, among others. So, so North Korea, U.S. summit talk is a big thing, and so trade wars with China is a big thing. So media must focus on these issues. So they sometimes forget uh, other tiny, you know, smaller things. But so, is he really serious to move on these issues, foreign issues, di diplomatic issues? So after the midterm election, now you said uh, next round of the presidential election started. So he really continues to move on, move these uh, diplomatic issues, or he will find something new to blind people's eyes again, or do you think he's serious to try to solve these problems in East Asia? Uh, I um, don't think he's serious about truly trying to solve these issues. They're extraordinarily complicated. Um, what I think his motivation is, uh, which I tried to sort of outline in my talk, is, is the idea that there is some agreement, modest, incremental, um, vague, uh, with the North Koreans, with the Chinese on, on trade, um, with China more generally, uh, so that he can claim some vast achievement. Uh, because there is a huge gap between what he accomplishes and what he claims. It's all, regardless of the merits of what he does, uh, uh, it's always the biggest, the best, the greatest in American history. He claims he's done more in two years than any other president in American history, which is absolutely not true. Uh, he claimed that the tax cut he made was the biggest in American history. Absolutely not true. In, in Singapore, as I said, even though the, they, they came out with this vague communique which said nothing beyond what's been in previous communiques, uh, uh, that the North Korean nuclear threat was over when the very following weeks, the um, administration negotiators continued to work focused on denuclearization. So it, it patently untrue. Um, but all he needs is a, is a piece of paper which he then can claim is amazing, wonderful. Uh, does he truly want to come up with a, the, a, a deal? I don't, uh, that, that really solves these issues, that truly denuclearizes North Korea irreversibly, um, a, uh, a deal with China on trade that um, fundamentally changes their predatory trade practices, their theft of technology. I'm sure he would welcome a, a true one, but those things are unattainable in the short term. And he is someone who simply wants the ability to claim these wonderful things, regardless of the merits. He's driven, I don't think, by uh, American national interest. He's driven really more than any politician I've ever seen in American, recent American history by personal, personal gain. Um, so uh, there's just, it, it's interesting to, to in, in the, the, the death of George H.W. Bush uh, was, was very much the opposite. Now every politician has an ego, they don't go into politics if they don't have an ego. 
every politician is motivated to some degree by personal interest, but um, he is uh, is different fundamentally from certainly any politician who's become president uh, in, in American history. So, uh, will he come up with other things to divert attention? Well, that's that's my biggest worry. As things go on, the easiest thing to do is to uh, go off somewhere and, and attempt uh, some sort of military action. I mean, um, it's this, this is, this sadly is, is uh, something that's happened many times before in American history. Other presidents have done it. I mean, if uh, uh, you remember uh, President Reagan, um, he invaded Grenada. Uh, that was not a serious security threat for the United States, but he did that within days after some, some bad news. There were, there were these suicide bombings that took place um, in Beirut, American uh, military barracks. There were 250, 260 American military who were killed. It was extremely bad uh, publicity, bad news, bad thing that happened. But within days, we invaded Grenada, uh, which was um, even even George H. W. Bush in uh, 1989. He uh, uh, he had been sort of accused of being a wimp uh, on foreign policy, and, and uh, there are a number of people who think that one of them he, he, early in his administration. Um, uh, we, we sent about 20, 25,000 troops to Panama to depose the uh, Nor uh, Noriega, uh, Manuel Noriega, who was the leader at the time. Um, and there was a lot of suspicion that this was a, a military action that was simply done, uh, in, well, the, one of the contributing factors was simply to uh, Change the subject and and, and ensure that uh, that George H. W. Bush had a had a had a better reputation. Um, when Clinton was faced with his Monica Lewinsky scandal, um, <clears throat> uh, that during that year um, there was a sort of at the height of it, he ordered a bombing campaign uh, against um, Saddam Hussein. In Iraq, and there were suspicions that again, this was something that was meant to change the subject. So, I just I, I think there is a there's Trump will be if things don't go well, and and the way things are going at at the moment, if you look down for the next couple of years, he's facing a lot of bad news. Uh, uh, I, I I what I fear is he's he's. He's the temptation for this as 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 the walls close in, uh, and if these these tepid small deals that he might be able to achieve and claim are great victories don't work, that's that's when the temptation arises. And and there are places in the world like North Korea and Iran where there are unfortunately, in my view, um, some. I wouldn't call them the mainstream, but there are people out there who believe we the only solution to both countries' uh, nuclear potential nuclear threat to the United States is preemptive military strike, and a preemptive military strike in either country is extraordinarily dangerous in my view because that could lead to full-scale war. Thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, I am a uh, correspondent bank to this analyst uh, regarding anti-money laundering and combating truth finance. I, I have a question uh, about uh, Huawei and ZTE, it's a uh, five farms. Uh, uh, that is a, a national security reason. Uh, Canadian authorities arrest the CFO of Huawei technology at US request today. What do you think about the influence uh, uh, Australia, India, and Japan and New Zealand. Uh, PECOM area, in the PECOM area, uh, uh, Japan is, uh, don't uh, forbidden uh, the 
what Japan can only use Huawei and ZTE in five generation, but Australia and India and New Zealand don't want you in the five generation. What do you think about that? For national security reasons. <clears throat> yeah, actually, we were just chatting a little bit about this arrest that took place in Canada of the daughter of the founder of Huawei, and it's unclear what she's been charged with, but that is a pretty significant event. Um, I'm not. Uh, she she will be ex she she was arrested uh, by the Canadians and will be extradited, moved to the United States to be charged with crimes that at this point are unclear. Um, but there's a growing uh, sense uh, in the United States that Huawei and other Chinese companies, uh, particularly in high technology, present um, some security challenges to the United States. Um, we have a, particularly when it uh, on a number of fronts. I mean, uh, we have, um, uh, when, when Chinese companies have been trying to buy American companies, uh, they have to go through a, a fairly rigorous process. Uh, it's called the CFIUS pro process. It's the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States. And in many cases, um, uh, companies that, that Chinese, American companies, the Chinese companies have been interested in buying have been blocked, or even in some cases, non-Chinese companies that might have, uh, for foreign non-Chinese companies that, that have some for uh, Chinese um, ownership, partial ownership, that's also been blocked. Um, and that's uh, a response to what Chinese have, have been been doing in terms of uh, intellectual property theft um, and uh, some of their equipment uh, may have some some things in them that that allow them to uh, to uh, uh, you know cause problems for for users um, and so uh, it's it's something that the U.S. is treating very seriously and and uh, it's one aspect of this, um, the, the, the overall reset in U.S. policy toward China that the U.S. is taking. The CFIUS process is a nonpartisan process. Um, it was actually used pretty extensively back in the early 80s uh, against Japan when <laughs> Japan was viewed uh, as a uh, strategic rival to the United States. Um, that's that's a world away, uh, and Japan, of course, is our ally. But that there was, you know, there was sort of at that point this uh, great fear that Japan was going to take over take over the world in, in the United States. But China um, is uh, is is a major challenge to the United States. I, I think. Most Americans uh, view it that way, and that's changed significantly uh, over the past um, 18 years. When I was in the Senate and uh, uh, finished in, two, in, in 2001, um, the last major project I worked on was getting China into the World Trade Organization. The Finance Committee was in charge of that, um, so there was a major effort to make sure that that happened, the U.S. had to pass some legislation to make it possible. The hope at that point, um, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, was that by getting into the World Trade Organization, China would, would uh, be in a rules-based system, would follow those rules. It was used by the Chinese to make some domestic structural reforms um, that helped its economy grow faster. Um, and the hope uh, among many Americans was this would lead toward a, 
greater growth in China, including the growth of a middle class, and in turn, that middle class would have greater, make greater demands for not just economic freedom, but more uh, freedom generally, based on some of the history of other countries in the region, such as South Korea and Taiwan, following a similar path. Um, that didn't happen. China, China's economy has grown exponentially, um, and it has not become more open, more free, more freer. And uh, and since really 2008, um, I think that's the, the the point where things really changed. They've they've taken a much more aggressive tone. They uh, view their own. Uh, the Chinese model as a more uh, uh, successful model than, than, than the U.S. model, um, and uh, this is this is they are um, doing many things uh, that are uh, a direct challenge to the United States. So I, I think we'll see. Uh, it'll be interesting to see why this arrest took place, what the actual charges are, but it's it's a pretty potent indication of how serious the, the uh, competition between the United States and Japan is. And it certainly, I, I can't imagine that it's going to help in the trade negotiations between China and the United States. The, I, I don't know if the Chinese yet have come out with any sort of statement about what happened, but, but it's, uh, it's only going to increase the tensions between the two sides. Thank you very much for, uh, for your very impressive uh, presentation. And I am studying under Professor Tsuchiya and also working uh, in the telecommunications industry. And then your uh, view against uh, Mr. Trump reminds me of uh, my ex, ex big boss, <laughs> who is the firm believer of uh, bilateral agreements uh, rather than multilateral negotiations. And uh, at that time, I, um, uh, as you uh, well know, telecommunication business are set on the uh, various uh, sets of multilateral negotiations. And uh, at that time, I could not persuade him the importance of multilateral uh, vague agreements. And uh, is there any tips or hint or way of, uh, say, persuading those kind of bosses that <laughs> multilateral agreement is also important. That's a, that's a very difficult question. Uh, in the case of Trump, uh, for example, uh, I, he's 72 now, and uh, there is no evidence that he can be persuaded uh, to change his opinion on certain things that he's held uh, an actual opinion on for 30 years. He doesn't, it seems impossible to educate him. His views on um, uh, multilateral trade agreements makes no sense. I mean, uh, uh, and his view that, that trade should be assessed on uh, a bilateral basis. If if he took an economics course in college, he obviously wasn't, he was sleeping at the time or just didn't pay attention because it, 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 it that doesn't, it, it's not a zero sum, trade is not a zero sum game. And it's a multi, it, it's, it's a multilateral process and you create multilateral systems. You can't, can't simply be done on a bilateral basis. Um, so tips on persuading someone that bilateral uh, is not as effective as multilateral. Uh, boy, um, if your ex 
ex-boss was involved in telecommunications and didn't realize that when telecommunications connects the whole world, I, uh, boy, I wish I could <laughs> come up with something to tell you, but uh, I, I, you know, you can present the facts uh, and uh, maybe it has to come from someone who's trusted by that individual so much that they can when they ex try and explain these things and the person just just rejects it out of hand, at least they won't reject it. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a greater chance to, to have a longer conversation and try to explain that why their views are, are inconsistent with the reality that's out there. Uh, or maybe you bring a whole bunch of their friends together and uh, have them try and, and, and state that. In the case of someone like Trump, it's probably best to have people who know him who are business people, for example. He, he, he seems to like to surround himself with CEOs and, and seems to believe them better. But he's had many CEO groups that have been formed and that, that hasn't, hasn't changed his opinion on, on these things. And uh, so, I'm sorry, I don't, <laughs> don't have a better better idea. But good question. I want to ask you more uh, intellectual property. Uh, Huawei and uh, ZTE is a uh, uh, world uh, uh, world number one and number two inter property uh, a number of internal properties uh, of farms. So uh, in 20, uh, 2017. Uh, so, how do you uh, evaluate uh, Peter Nabal, uh, this by China, or uh, Chinese comparative advantage? Uh, for instance, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, April, uh, uh, 15th April in this year, uh, that uh, Chinese uh, uh, still uh, always uh, uh, by cyber attack, uh, intellectual property, or internet uh, law in China. Uh, and so, what do you think about intellectual property issues? Um, you, you asked about Peter Navarro as yeah. well? Um, uh, well, it, it, Chinese theft of internet, in, intellectual property is, is, is a serious problem um, and it's one of the main issues that is supposed to be addressed in the US-China trade negotiations um, and uh, I think the um, I'm, I'm not an expert on this uh, issue but when it comes to intellectual property I think one of the things that uh, makes a country more interested in the rules uh, is when they arrive at a state of development where they are producing their own intellectual property which they want to uh, preserve. Their incentive to uh, engage on this issue in a productive way goes up the higher they are on the intellectual property food chain, if you will. So uh, as China is developing more new technologies that they want to preserve, I think their willingness to work more cooperatively is going to increase. Um, and uh, But that takes a long time. Um, and there's sort of a threshold where their benefit from stealing intellectual property uh, uh, is overtaken by their need to preserve intellectual property. I don't think we're close, that close to that now. But they are definitely moving toward uh, higher value added, higher technology. Uh, but I, I, I think this is, this is one of the most serious issues in the two sides, and I don't know how much progress is going to be made 
this issue, in, certainly in the next 90 days. Um, Peter Navarro, who uh, is one of the top trade advisors to the president, um, is a, I think a very troubling personality. Uh, I he somehow was able to get a PhD from Harvard, um, and it mystifies me how someone who is a Harvard PhD would have such uh, out of the mainstream views of trade and economics as he does. Um, he has had a uh, uh, very. Uh, I would. I don't. I don't know if you've ever looked at some of the videos that he used to put together. You, you've probably seen these on China. Very primitive, uh, very um, strange uh, videos on the threat posed by China. Uh, clearly, China is a very real problem in any number of areas, but uh, he is a is a controversial person because of his very, very strange views. And within the administration, he's faced, uh, there are some somewhat more mainstream views of things uh, from uh, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin um, and others who've tried to keep him out of the, out of the White House, but he's survived somehow. He's there, survived. There was a, he, he, early in the administration, uh, the previous uh, head of the Council on Economic Advisors, uh, I've forgotten his name, he was a gold, Goldman Sachs uh, executive, but anyway, they had sidelined him and not, he, he, I don't know if you've ever seen the White House, but there's the, there's the West Wing where everything takes place, there's this, there's this very huge building nearby, uh, uh, but where most people like him were located, he was not, he was not allowed into the into get into any meetings, so uh, he actually would um, what he would do to see the president would be to spend his days wandering around the West Wing, waiting for a chance to bump into the president. So uh, he was really out of out of out of power, but he stayed around, and some of his uh, other people uh, have left and. Um, his views on trade are very similar to Trump's views on trade. So uh, he's made his way back into becoming influential. He actually, on this, uh, at the G20 summit, um, there was an attempt by some of those who didn't like him in the administration to prevent him from going to Argentina. He managed to get on the trip there. Then they tried to prevent him from being at the dinner with the president of China, Xi Jinping. But somehow he made it there. If you look at the picture, he's just a, a few chairs down from from president. So he was there, and he's he's uh, obviously got the president's ear on on, on these things. Uh, I think fortunately, when it comes, uh, he, he he's not been terribly outspoken about Japan. So with a little bit of luck, he won't be involved in the negotiations, uh, the bilateral uh, U.S.-Japan negotiations. He's been fixated on China for, for most of his career. Thank you very much. So the N NEC guy must be Gary Cohn. Gary Cohn. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay, so um, time's up, so we want to close this uh, lecture. So please join me to thank Mr. Bob uh, about his great insight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.